Testing, 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 testing. Okay, hi guys. I'm gonna just do. I'm just. Come on. Ah, tails. Uh, my current Dan Henry, I nearly dropped it. That would have been Oh, guys, do check out the Fortis YouTube chat. Live to YouTube, 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 YouTube channel. And I think that's Dan's motivation. I think he wants to. Sorry, there's a there's a moped or something. Sempre succede questo quando sono registrando un video. C'è questo qua fuori con la macchina. Fa tutto questo casino e poi hai sentito? Hai sentito questo? Okay, hi guys, and welcome to the show. Today, a double unboxing of a brand very close to my heart. It is, of course, Dan Henry. Now, as you guys know, I've reviewed so many Dan Henrys over the years. I've owned two of them. Uh, my current Dan Henry is the 1962. With this new release, it celebrates five years. So he's actually done a kind of revamped version of his very first watch. So what I'm gonna do with this video, I'm gonna unbox it, give my initial impressions. They're kind of condensed mini review if you like so without further ado oh my god i almost forgot wristwatch check wearing the fortis do check out the fortis youtube channel it is absolutely fantastic some really great content on there and it's refreshing to see a brand putting real effort um into their youtube channel so i'll link that below for those unfamiliar with the legendary collector turned king of the micro brand watch world dan henry hails from brazil Dan rose to prominence in the watch world after owning one of the most extensive and largest collections of over 1,500 rare timepieces. This master hunter of watches then launched a website called Timeline.watch to document chronologically this vast treasure trove of horology and share it with the world. It remains a wonderful, free, highly informative and easy to use online resource that I urge anyone truly into watches to enjoy. By using an interactive scale, you can instantly select a year and then scroll to reveal more details on what amazing watches were from that corresponding period. This was the genesis behind the structure of his own brand that he would finally release in September 2016. The concept is simple, but ingenious and something that all true watch enthusiasts appreciate. Each watch he releases is named after the year it was inspired from, then on the case back, there is always something fun and beautifully engraved in a motif representing something mechanical related from that particular year or period. For example, my own 1962 racing chronograph has the three-dimensional Maserati Tipo 60 birdcage automobile. I'll do a quick knife check. This is the Hawkbill blade. If you remember, I did a video about this. This is the all Japanese made steel version uh, of the famous Hannibal Lecter knife from the book and the movie. So, yeah, that's my knife check. Haven't used it for a while. Another little surgical incision. There we go. Drum roll, please. Have, yep, Dan Henry. Oh, nice. It's blue this time. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, look at that blue dial. That is really vibrant and beautiful. Look at, God, that pulchritude in this blue sunburst. Oh, interesting. It's ratcheted to the hour. That's interesting. I hope this is a black dial because I, I'm kind of keen to see how that one comes out. It is a sandwich dial. It's a bit like a Panerai with that 12. Anyway, let's um, pop it on a wrist, take it for a spin. See what all the fuss is about. All right, guys, quick interruption. Please don't forget to like this video. Very important indeed, because it actually YouTube now shows me in the comments who has liked the most videos. So I'm going to be prioritizing you guys in my responses, especially to questions or just generally interesting discussions. 
Unlike many other microbrands, this first-hand access to some unbelievably valuable and highly desired watches enabled Dan to make affordable, clever amalgamations based on them. This results in the watch being far more compelling, imbued with a sense of verisimilitude that can only be a culmination of experience from owning the original watches that inspires his new creations. So by using contemporary materials, by that at the same time uh, utilizing high-end factories in Asia to keep costs down, uh, as well as you know these Seiko-made, um, very robust quartz calibers, you're able to get something that gives you the feel. For example, the Evil Nina here, that the 1962 uh, is based on. You know, I doubt I'm ever going to have ducktails amounts of money to find an Evil Nina. And then they're very fragile. Um, I can't even imagine the cost of servicing them. So this gives me a little bit of that feel. Now, what inspired the designs of these pieces? Well, once again, if you delve into Dan's impressive collection, you will find two largely overlooked references from Breitling. Breitling had already for decades been well established as an innovator and industry leader when it comes to chronographs, especially by the time the reference 765 watches were first developed for military pilots in the mid-1950s. The most important thing to note here, that this was the age before quartz watches had been introduced, and these daredevil pioneering pilots of the time rarely did depend on their watches. Therefore, Breitling gave it a bezel to show a changeable second time zone and a simplified, clean, balanced layout to be ultra-legible, as well as being larger in 42mm in diameter. This scale, which is normal today, was considered giant at the time, long before the oversized trends of the 2000s. The logic follows the same thinking behind the more iconic Navitimer that preceded it, but obviously that was far more complicated and made larger so you could read those complex logarithmic scales. Now if you missed it, do check out this video on the Navitimer, but also about Breitling as a whole and how they were a trendsetter, an innovator, with some surprising facts um, that I share in that video. To honour this glorious age of pushing flight to the very limits, Dan has chosen the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird as the subject of the relief on the beautifully contrasting finishes of the case back. The Blackbird is a long-range, high-altitude Mach 3 capable strategic reconnaissance aircraft developed and manufactured by the American aerospace company Lockheed Corporation. Not only was it operated by the United States Air Force, but also NASA during the Cold War. The strong symmetry of its elegantly shaped wings mirrors the equilibrium found in the perfectly proportioned dial layout. But if you are to look very closely, you will notice, however, the 3 o'clock sub-dial is ever so slightly closer to the one at 6 compared to the one at 9. A very subtle and cheeky nod to the watches it homages back in the day, the vintage pieces of course, and homage in the, in the truest sense of the word. The decision to make it a sandwich dial is an interesting one, as it gives the watch something more unique and different compared to the Breitling original. Along with the subdials deeper recessed compared to Dan's first version from the launch of the brand, they also finished off in a brighter metallic finish with a concentric circle texture. So what about negatives and positives? Well, this is a bit of a tricky one for me because firstly, it is a commemorative limited edition watch, and secondly, it's a brand very close to my heart. I have a great admiration for Dan. He's incredibly knowledgeable, a real gentleman. However, I do have a duty to my audience to be open and honest, but respectfully, of course, always respectfully. My main issue here is the height. While I understand the reason was to emulate and capture the feel of the oversized original, they did house larger mechanical Venus movements typical of the 1960s, not the thinner VK63 Mecha Quartz, which could have allowed it to be slimmer without necessarily needing to uh, make the diameter smaller. Being a more slender profile would have just made it that much more cuff friendly. However, if you like the heft and presence of it, then this will not affect you. The previously reviewed 1937 manages to be around 12 millimeters tall, including that very pronounced domed glass compared to the 13.9 millimeters of the statuesque 1963. 
Talking of the movement, it is a shame that it's not mechanical, but I understand this is extremely difficult to do affordably. Your choices are very limited, unfortunately. Under $500, you're looking at the Seagull movements, which are highly problematic. And if you don't get a good batch or a good connection, they can have big reliability problems. Alternatively, there's the Seiko NH88 or even the Swiss Valju 7750, but this would push the final price to between one to two grand and possibly even more. Nonetheless, you'd still get that semi-smooth tick of the Mecha Quartz being somewhat of a hybrid, so it doesn't feel completely soulless for those who like the romance of more traditional movements. So again, with this caliber, you're getting that 24 hour dial at three o'clock. It's not really a complication I personally need. The only time you really need a, uh, well, two times you need a 24 hour um, display is if you're going into space like this, because there's no night or day in space and you, it's actually handy, or you're going into caves like the Rolex Explorer 2 was originally intended for. Yeah, I know, crazy. I mean, who goes under <laughs> in a cave for that long? People do apparently, and they need the Rolex to do it. But anyway, different video, different video. Regretfully, the ghost date is still present. And for the first time, I spotted some slight QC issues on the bead blasted sections on the back of the case. But to be fair, the rest of the dial work, super sharp case finishing on the rest of the watch and the overall quality was outstanding for this price range. And I stress, this is a $280 watch. Let's not forget that. My final critique is that I do feel the watch is not really bringing anything new to the table, aside from these beautiful new color combinations. Sounds harsh, I know. It is unequivocally a cracking watch, but with such watches as the devilishly elegant and classy Art Deco style of the 1937, with its sector dial, or the super advanced 1972 Maverick chronograph, the 1963 here feels a little outdone by its own relatives. The 1963 is not trying to be his best watch. It's a watch about commemorating his first release. So it's not gonna you know, raise the bar, so to speak. In terms of positives, the first thing is obvious, the inherent and remarkable great value. These being under $300 at the time of making this video is undeniably impressive. It also looks more expensive than it is, and there's none of the fragility you get with vintage timepieces. You can really actually wear the hell out of it. Many complain about the glass used in the other Dan Henry watches, so I'm sure they will be pleased by the addition of that domed sapphire glass this time around. The sunburst blue dial with the brushed steel bezel is just right and steals the show, I think, here. It adds a much needed bit of pizzazz of the initial release five years ago. The 50 meters water resistance is understandable considering it is a chronograph and therefore has more points of entry, the piston head pushers and crown. But perhaps the most noticeable improvement to me is the super luminova and great orientation compared to the other timepieces, thanks to that large 12 o'clock numerals and also it being applied on all baton style hour, minute and syringe style of the seconds hand. One of the biggest and undeniably greatest strengths of this watch is its handsome and tasteful design, but at the same time also being packed with some useful complications, especially the second time zone, which for me is super handy with families overseas and coordinating Zoom calls across the country, which I recently discussed in my GMT review. It goes without saying there's also the obvious accuracy and performance you get with Quartz technology. And naturally, the bolt action straps are super fun and easy to switch out so quickly to match any outfit instantly. Being able to work with so many different straps just elevates your whole sprezzatura to another level, you know? So, very, very cool indeed. In conclusion, another solid offering from a brand that has provided me with so much enjoyment over the years at a very accessible price. And that is what it's all about. The elitist watch publications will use the cliché of calling it a value proposition, and ignorant watch snobs who have no idea about the amount of fortitude, time, effort, or the cost of what it takes to design, manufacture and release a watch, they will of course criticise where it is made, or the fact that it's just a quartz watch. 
This continues to be a brand for real watch enthusiasts who appreciate and who want something fun and don't want to spend a fortune. So is this Dan's best watch uh, yet? Well, I don't think it is. I'm, I'm sticking with my 1962. This is my favorite. Is it the best aviation chronograph in its price range? Well, possibly, but it's a tough one. Hemmel's airfoil with the mechanical seagull movement that I have talked about before offers a hell of a lot of bang for your buck at under $500, along with its clean design and splendidly complex movement. Then there's Seiko with its illustrious past of making military chronographs for the pilots of the RAF and so on. My personal favorite still after all of this is the beloved Seiko Flighty or Flightmaster SNA411. That will always be difficult to compete with. And don't even get me started on the Citizen Skyhawks and Navihawks. Again, we have discussed those to death on this channel. So while this is not the reigning king in its price range, it's still up there. It's still a beautiful watch and a logical way to celebrate five years of greatness. But importantly, it is pure class in its own distinctive way. So I'm going to leave it there. Please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it. Very important indeed. And also don't forget to add your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, and all the rest of it down below, especially what you think of this new release and what do you think uh, you'd like to see from Dan Henry in the future. Uh, that's about it. I'll catch you in the next one. Thank you for watching. Ciao.